Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from you. St. Thomas Aquinas. So now, we need to see now how we are going to fight, what are our weapons, and especially the inner attitude. Sometimes when you fight, the inner attitude is more important than the weapons. Again, for the people who know martial arts. <laughs> In a certain sense, if the inner attitude is right, you can use whatever technique. If the inner, inner attitude is wrong, you can know all the techniques and you will never make it. Just before continuing, someone mentioned to me that sometimes you can have a... Um, well, maybe you're sleeping and you find such a strength against you. Some, it happens a lot. I'm sure, I'm sure that half of you or one third of you had already things like that. So you were sleeping and you had the impression of an operation or something like that. I would say that if it's not psychological, it could be a usual attacks and for that you don't, <coughs> don't worry. For instance, you have the impression that you're leaving your body. Or you just pray your rosary and that stops. One time in Africa, I had the, when, just when I arrived in Africa, I was sleeping and I saw a, a hand, a black hand like that, with a long nails coming on my face. Wow! <laughs> During the night. <laughs> so I prayed pray the rosary and said, Ooh! <laughs> Bad night. And uh, another time I, I was sleeping, and, uh, I was feeling a hand beside me. Cold, a cold hand, like that. <laughs> so I, I woke up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, it was my, my hand. <laughs> 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 uh, I slept on my arm. Like that. <laughs> so let's come back on the. Um, <laughs> So, St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Indeed, we live as human beings, but we do not wage war according to human standards, for the weapons of our warfare are not merely human, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds, and we destroy arguments. St. Paul is very clear, the attack is not a human attack. We don't fight against blood and flesh. And the weapons are not natural weapons. We are going to use supernatural weapons. You remember the different principle that the devil wants to destroy in us, faith, hope, and charity. So the first thing that you are going to do in your spiritual warfare is to nourish your faith, your hope, and your charity. We had a retreat with a priest last week, and the preacher, starting his retreat with the story of the two wolves, he said that one, day, one time you had a grandfather speaking to his granddaughter, well, I have two wolves in my mind. And the granddaughter was afraid, so, well, one is really bad, one is full of revenge, full of hatred, full of anger, and the other one is a good wolf, and just want to be good and to be nice with the people and the granddaughter asks, who is going to win? Because they fight in my soul. And the granddad, the, the grandfather said, well, the one I'm going to feed. And it's a really simple story, but very relevant story. We have in our soul, we all know that we have two wolves. Wolves. Uh, and uh, one is bad, one is good. We can do the worst, we can do the best. Which one are we going to feed? The devil starts always by trying to starve people. 
You have to feed your faith, you have to feed your hope, you have to feed your charity. And amazingly, if you look at the Gospel, you will find that Jesus speaks three times, only three times, about nourishment. I'm going to quote it three times, and you are going to see that that fits very well with faith, hope, and charity. In Matthew 4, chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus said, It is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So he says that the word of God, the Bible, is a nourishment. Now, it's the nourishment of what? Of your love, of your hope? Faith. If you don't read the Bible, if you just are happy by listening the Bible at Mass, maybe it's not enough for spiritual warfare. You have to read more the Bible to nourish your faith. It's a nourishment. Jesus spoke a second time about food when he was speaking with a Samaritan woman. The disciple went to buy food and he was speaking alone with the Samaritan woman. And when they came back, they said to Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Uh, the will of God, obedience. Obedience is a nourishment. And the nourishment of what? Of love or hope? I guess, but it's very difficult to explain why, <coughs> obedience is the nourishment of hope. Because when you, you don't obey, you believe only in yourself. And if you feel weak, there is nobody to help you. When you nourish your life by obedience, you re you're related to someone else, higher than you. When, especially when it's obedience to God. So you keep hope. Because you're related to someone more powerful than you. We have to love obedience, actually. When you obey your pastor in your parish, when you obey your bishop, when you obey the pope, when you that is to nourish your hope. The one who discovered that actually is our founder, Father Marie Dominique Philippe, while he was in Senegal, again in Africa, speaking with a very brilliant priest. And this priest was in a state of despair. And Father Philippe said that he has never seen someone with such an anguish and despair. And he was speaking with him, trying to help him, without finding any way to help him. And suddenly that popped out in his mind. He said, uh, do you obey? And the guy said, well, to whom? Uh, to your bishop, for instance. He said, no, the, from the time I entered the seminar, uh, I was so brilliant that even the bishop came to ask me for answers. And I, I give advices to the bishop. And I never obey. And for Father Philippe, it became obvious that uh, the nourishment of a hope is to obey. Just try and you will see. I'm sure it's true. And in John chapter 6, Jesus speaks about another nourishment when he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The three nourishments of our spiritual life. We are at the image of God, and the devil wants to destroy the image of God. We are the image of God because of our faith, because of our hope, because of our charity. But now we have to nourish this image of God, otherwise it will disappear. And according to the Bible, you have three nourishments, the Word of God, to nourish your faith, obedience to nourish your hope, and charity and Eucharist to nourish your charity. That's the first basic and daily nourishment of our life to avoid temptations and to avoid uh, all these things we're talking about.
But now, even if you nourish your faith, your hope and your charity, you will feel weak sometimes. It's not because you are not nourished enough. It's because you are just human being, and by nature we are weak. We have to understand that the victory we are going to have is not our victory, but his victory. Only one is victorious, Jesus. He is the victorious one. You can't fight alone with the devil. He's too strong for you. But Jesus is stronger than him. So the only way is to be always with Jesus. The victory is at the cross. And as I told you, Jesus didn't win as a lion. He won as a lamb. We don't have to fear our weaknesses. Our weaknesses are good news. When I'm weak, therefore I am strong, says St. Paul. What we have to do is to fight, but he will win. John of Arc used to say that with the, the armies, French armies, by the way. And uh, <laughs> she, said, she said to the armies, we will fight and he will win. It's a very good theology. We will fight, he will win. The victory is his, the fight is ours. And for that, I would say that the first condition, now I come to the inner disposition of when you fight. The inner disposition is to feel as a victorious. As I told you during the Mass, sometimes we start fighting as a loser. It's very important for us, we have the victory. So when you fight, you fight as someone who knows already that he has the victory. You know, so at this moment, there is no, it's not a big deal. You fight, but you have the victory. There is no way you can be a loser. Because Jesus has the victory already. It's, it's 2,000 years ago. It's already, it's already done. The problem is that we don't see it. We are victorious and we don't even notice that we are victorious. We don't have eyes to see the things. There is this beautiful passage in... Uh, 2 Kings, chapter 6. The prophet Elisha <coughs> was, a pro was a prophet, as I just told you. <laughs> prophet Elijah was a prophet. <laughs> Good news. Uh, <laughs> thank you. He was a prophet, so he could see, uh, for instance, when the, the, the pagan king wanted to entrap Israel. Elisha was the prophet of Israel, and he could see that the king wanted to make a trap to Israel. So each time the bad king, let's say, wanted to entrap Israel, when he arrived, Israel wasn't there. So he said, I must have a spy in my kingdom. So he tried to put everything to the, everybody to the test, and he said, are you the spy or the spy? And uh, the guy said, no, we are not spies, but you know, there is a man called Elisha, he's a prophet, and what you think in your room, he already knows. So the king said, well, let's get rid of Elisha after we can fight against Israel in peace. And one day, they tried to surround the place where was Elisha. Elisha had a servant, and when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning, and went out. Behold, an army with horses and chariots was round about the city. Uh, sometimes you fight with the devil and you have the impression that, or with your temptations, you am overwhelmed. He's around the city, uh, infestation, vexation, I don't know, but I'm surrounded. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall I do? So he is a loser here. Uh, well, we are just two. They are Chariots everywhere. And Elisha said, Fear not, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. So I can imagine the servants, <laughs> those who are with us. <laughs> so, you, you mean you and me? <laughs> and, 
Then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, I pray you, open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. So he could see the armies of God surrounding the army of the enemies. Those who are with us are more than those who are against us. So you see, this prayer is very powerful. Open my eyes that I can see the victory when I'm fighting. We must fight as winners, as people who know already that they have the victory. And for that, something which is really good is the power of praise. I don't know if you have already read this book from Merlin Carother, The Power of Praise. It's a beautiful book. And you have in the Bible, you have in the Bible some moments where the people were surrounded by the armies. For instance, if you take 2 Chronicles, chapter 20, it's a very nice chapter. 2 Chronicles, chapter 20. Because the sign that you are a winner is that you already sing Hallelujah. And here you see something really interesting. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, and with them some of the Meunites, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom. Jehoshaphat was afraid. He set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel in the middle of the assembly and he said, Listen, O Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Thus say the Lord to you, do not fear or be dismayed at the great multitude. You see, it starts always with that. Do not fear. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Ah, beautiful news. Tomorrow, go down against them. This battle is not for you to fight. Take your position. Stand still and see the victory of the Lord on your behalf. To stand. That is exactly what we have to do. The battle is not ours. We just stand. If you take again Ephesians chapter 6, you will see that it comes over and over on this verb, stand firm. I don't ask you to punch, to swings, but to stand. And the Lord will give swings. <laughs> they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood, good position, and said, Listen to me, O Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe his prophets. When he had taken counsel with the people, and notice what would be their strategy for war, when they had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy splendor as they went before the army, saying, give thanks to the Lord for his... You know, Imagine George Bush going to Iraq with just the choir first. <laughs> just the singers. Let's, let's put the singers first. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Everybody. Well, I wish it would be like that. But uh, here, that, what does that mean? That means that when you fight, thanksgiving and praise must be first. Because you have already the victory. And the power of praise is really amazing. You have to praise the Lord even when you are in the, the, the middle of the, your struggle. Because you show at this moment to the Lord that you do believe. Uh, people coming from, uh, uh, friends coming from Orange Grove, they probably remember that I was lost in Toronto. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know what happened to me? I was lost in, a, I went, I'm always lost, but. Uh, <laughs> I went to Toronto with a group of kids, and uh, I, I didn't know uh, too much English at this time, uh, for World Youth Day. And uh, I was upset at night because they had music all night long. I just wanted uh, a couple of hours of sleep. So I, 
I left the crowd, one million people, you know, to go to a field and to sleep in very far from, from the place. And I slept, but at five... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what I didn't suppose, that at five o'clock in the morning, the rain fell, and you have one million people turning, <laughs> and I couldn't never find my group again. So <laughs> I, had the, I had the choice, sp spending the mass with my group, or... Uh, going to concelebrate with the priest and trying to find so I decided to concelebrate with the priest the problem when I after mass they had to leave to take a bus we were in Canada the bus were going to uh, Buffalo Airport and they had a plane to go back to Laredo and uh, I was alone <laughs> <laughs> so where is my group and I I try to, I remain at the, the entrance, if we can call that an entrance, when you have one million people leaving a place. <laughs> During three hours, uh, exhausted, you know, angry, uh, uh, cursing, and uh, uh, swearing. And I was really <laughs> And after a while, I say, well, I remember this book. I was really bad, you know, I was really mad and in trouble because I had no no telephone number, no money. Uh, now I could be a beggar in Toronto uh, with, <laughs> with a little card. <laughs> One dollar, please. Uh, a big beer, uh, yeah. So I had to, uh, I saw all the people go like that leaving, and I just remembered this, uh, this book from Merlin Carter, The Power of Praise. I said, let's praise the Lord. So I, <laughs> I started to sing alone. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord, it's so great to be here. It's just wonderful to see these one million people living. And, uh, I'm so happy today. But believe it or not, just the moment I decided to do that instead of cursing, I saw here Brother of St. John in front of me, Mary David. And I said, You know what? I'm lost. <laughs> and he was, uh, he was nice enough. He was nice enough to tell me I'm with a group, another group uh, from uh, Princeville, from Peoria in North. But well, you <laughs> have pity on you because you, <laughs> you look so miserable. So uh, he left his group. He took his car and he, he brought me to Buffalo Airport directly. And when we arrived in Buffalo Airport, we were just waiting, and the bus arrived, and he said, "Hey, <laughs> I'm here." <laughs> So I can say the power of praise. <laughs> but actually, yeah, sometimes when you really want to curse and you, you're overwhelmed by uh, your problems, sometimes it's very good just to praise the Lord. You, uh, you praise the Lord as if you had already the victory. It's very powerful. Just <laughs> taste it. And now, usually, the Lord will always and always work with you through your weaknesses. He wants you to reach this point, to be able to say, when I am weak, therefore I am strong. When I am a lamb, therefore I am a lion. But when I play the lion, when I try to be tough, I'm ridiculous. So we have to be rooted and to start loving our poverty and difficulties and, and uh, miseries. Because it's just our human being, we're just ourselves. So we don't have any, you know, we don't have to play the game to appear, to look good, and to... You're free from the burden of having to be the good Catholic. Isn't it great? <laughs> <laughs> this is the good news. I don't have to appear the good Catholic anymore. So it's okay, I can be weak. Yeah, I can be weak. And you, I, I do prefer when you're weak. Look at David and Goliath. David, for instance, when he was uh, at the, the top of the beginning of his, uh, his mission, had to fight with the Philistine. You remember this famous passage, huh? the giant Philistine, Goliath. And at the moment, uh, Saul make f makes fun of him, says, you're a kid, the guy is, is a strong man, he's a giant, he, he learned how to fight from his childhood, you have never learned how to fight, and you, pre you claim that you are going to defeat him? At least take my armor. Saul clothes David with his armor, he put a bronze helmet on his head, 
and closed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor, and he tried in vain to walk, <laughs> and he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with this, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wedding and put them in his shepherd's bag. You see, little weapons, not the big armor and the trying to be a tough guy. Don't play this game, you're not a tough guy. <laughs> Just let, take your little... Uh, there is a saint who said that the, this little... Uh, Where do you say the, the thing? Huh? Huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and uh, the beads, the, there is a saint saying that this is the rosary. Each bead is like the little stones of David. You say it, and bing, the giant is defeated. The rosary is also a very strong weapon. But you see, it's a weapon for the little kids. You don't look uh, great with your rosary. You look so stupid. You say, hey, Mary, for grace. <laughs> and uh, the devil fears you more than when you look great. And the Philistine came on and drew near to David and his shield bearer in from him. When the Philistines looked and saw David, his disdain him. For he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistines said to David, <coughs> Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give you flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with swords and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. That's it. I'm nothing, but I come in the name of the Lord. You can't be my master. I will master you, even though I'm weak, even though I'm a youth, even though I'm just a, a boy or a girl. And I will master you, because I come in the name of the Lord. The only condition is not to fear your weakness, is not to fear your littleness, let's say. <coughs> if you remember, I will give another example. In the book of Judges, chapter 7, the Lord said to Gideon, the troops with you are too many for me to give the Madianites into their hand. Israel will not only take the credit away from me, saying, my own hand have delivered me. You see, if you were always very tough guy, no weaknesses, always very good, well, after a while you are going to think that you're really a good guy or really a good girl. And sometimes it's a bad news because you are going to think now I can walk by myself, I don't need even God. This is the sin. In a certain sense, if you really want to be autonomous and to walk by yourself, you don't need God in your life. The only way is that, God, I'm in need. I beg you to be my, my help, my shepherd, my, my master, because by myself I'm nothing. At this moment, you're strong. So he said to Gideon, you're too numerous, too, too many people to fight. Now, therefore, proclaim this in the hearing of the troops. Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home. Can you imagine you say that to the people in, in Iraq? Ah. Whoever wants to return home, returns. Well, I guess that we uh, have <laughs> less people. Eh? Thus Gideon sifted them out. 22,000 returned and 10,000 remained. It's a big amount of people leaving the army. Eh? Then the Lord said to Gideon, the troops are still too many Take them down to the water, and I will sift them out for you there. <coughs> when I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go with you. And when I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So he brought the troops down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, All those who lap the water with their tongues, as a dog laps, what do you think? Is he going to take it or not? You shall put the one side. No, you keep all the bad guys. <laughs> all the guys who, who lap the water like dogs. All those who kneel down, well-educated people, to drink, 
putting the hand to the mouth, you shall put to the other side. So it takes just the bad guys. The number of those that lapped were 300, but all the rest of the troops knelt down to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 that lapped, I will deliver you from the Madianite. You see, we started with 3,000 soldiers. We end with 300 Gideon operation. Now, tell me the percentage. I'm sure you're good in mathematics. 99% of reduction. You're too strong for me. I want you to be weak. And I will make you weak. Ah, that's the problem. When you start the spiritual warfare, you will feel weak. Always. And that will be your daily bread, to always feel weak and unable to continue li your life. Lord, I can do one step, but I don't know if I will make it until tonight. And you start the day knowing you don't even know if you will have the strength to arrive at night. And this is the good news. I'm sorry to say that, but this is the gospel. I have no other good news for you today. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly the, what Jesus wants us to be. Humble people. Peaceful people. Lambs, not lions. Not tigers. And at this moment when we are there, and many times in your life, the Lord will make you poor. Blessed are the poor. He starts always the spiritual job in our soul with poverty. It will make me feel very poor. Now I can use you. But if you feel too great, if you feel too, uh, you know, in control, I cannot do anything with you. You will end thinking that you made it. I am the Lord. So it's very important for us not to fear poverty. And it will be always like that. You could also read, for instance, uh, when they took Jericho. During seven days, they turned around the city of Jericho. And the seventh day, what did they do? They sang again, praise the Lord. And the walls of Jericho fell down. But now, you take the chapter after that, they were so happy, so proud of themselves. You turn one page and you have another battle, the battle of Ai. <coughs> and Ai was a little city. So they sent two spies and the guy came back saying, well, it's a big deal. Don't, uh, don't go with all the troops, just send uh, 200,000 soldiers, it's okay, or 20,000, it's okay. So presumption now. So they went, they fought and they were defeated. Each time Israel thinks they are strong enough, they are defeated. Each time Israel thinks they are weak, but they put their trust in God, they win. So we have to understand. This is the rule of spiritual warfare. The rule of spiritual warfare is when I'm weak, therefore I'm strong. When I accept my weakness, my littleness, Therefore, I'm strong. That's the reason why the little Therese of Lisieux is so strong. Because she knew she was just little. She never said, I'm an eagle. She said, I'm a sparrow. You know? And uh, for us, we all want to be eagles. It's a symbol of America, no? <laughs> America. God bless America. <laughs> but uh, we are sparrows. <laughs> we are nice sparrows. There is but one eagle. Jesus and John, maybe. But for us, we have to be humble people. We have progressively to go down if we want to go up. You know, it's funny because God always makes upside down. Everything upside down. You want to go up? He says, go down. You want to go down, so go up. This is <laughs> it's always turning everything upside down. And uh, it's what is beautiful, because it, it's the wisdom of the cross. It's, uh, I enter wisdom, which is not my wisdom. I, I, I wouldn't have imagined my spiritual life would be like that. You thought you were a good guy, and you didn't even notice that you were the, 
precisely the bad guy, the Pharisees. And you thought you were a poor sinner, and Jesus praises you. Like the guy who said, Lord, have pity on me, because I'm th this one <coughs> went back justified, and the Pharisee was guilty. And when Jesus said, the prostitute will precede you, wow, what, how could he dare saying that to lawyers and Pharisees? The prostitutes will precede you in heaven. Come on. <laughs> Why did he say that? Because at least they knew they were sinners. That the only condition to win the battle is to be honest. I am a sinner. And even when I do good, most of the time my intention is bad. <laughs> you can do good things with, for bad reasons. Now, don't be too guilty. You can be honest, lucid on that, and you, you deal with. It's okay. Lord, I'm just that. I, even when I try to do good things, I, I'm always looking at me and saying, well, good job. <laughs> you give an arm to someone and say, oh, you, you're very good today. <laughs> How can we stop this mirror? Huh? Even when we are good, we are not so good. If we would e really would have what we deserve, we would be surprised. Eh? So at least at this moment, you come back to the point of the spiritual warfare. You are really rooted in your littleness. And from this point, you can win. Because at this moment, the ego will overshadow you. At this moment, you have the power of the king of kings for you. Because he will never leave his son, when his son remains a son. I will end just with an uh, atomic bomb uh, <laughs> for atomic problems, for possession, at least to mention when there is a particular fight, you have what we call the exorcism. The Catechism of the Church speaks about the exorcism in, in this way. When the Church asks publicly and authoritatively, in the name of Jesus Christ, name of Jesus Christ, that a person or object be protected against the power of the evil one and withdrawn from his dominion, it is called exorcism. You see, when the church, it's not you, ask publicly and with authority in the name of Jesus Christ that a person or an object would be protected and that the evil one would withdraw from his dominion. This is an exorcism. Jesus performed exorcism and from him the church has received the power and the office of exorcising. Jesus is the only exorcist. But he said to the disciples, go and cast out the devils. So that means that the church and each baptized people, so you, are exorcist. Because of your baptism, you have power over the devil. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to explain after. Don't, don't start doing exorcism tonight. <laughs> I will say a but soon. <laughs> but the, the first root of our uh, exorcism is the baptism, not the priesthood. You don't need to be a priest or a bishop to be exorcist. A baptized is exorcist. That's the reason why our Protestant brothers, sometimes they perform exorcism and that works well. Nothing wrong with that. But the Catholic Church, for disciplinary reasons, decided to maintain the power of the exorcism or the exercise of the exorcism to the priest with the authorization of the bishop. It's a discipline. The root is the baptism, not the priesthood. But for some reasons of discipline, and you would be really daring of doing the contrary, it would be very imprudent, because you cannot deal with the devil if you're not in obedience. But it's just a question of discipline. Actually, the root of the baptism, the authority we have over the devil, comes from the baptism, not from the priesthood. And the church continues, in a simple form, exorcism is performed at celebration of baptism. I like to say that when I 
I see people coming with a very cute baby. See, he's not cute. <laughs> They're upset usually. <laughs> no, no, he's, he's a pagan. <laughs> We're going to do an exorcism on him. And that's true, during the rite of the baptism, you do at the moment an exorcism. Not that the baby is possessed, but he has the mark of the devil because he was conceived with the original sin. It's not a possession. But it's definitely the mark of the devil. The devil knows him. He didn't know the Virgin Mary. Oh, there is a baby here? I don't... I can't put my, my mark on her. First time he had a clue that some, something was wrong in the genealogy. <laughs> you know, all the babies from Adam and Eve to Mary, he was able to put his brand. It's mine, it's mine, mine. And there is a baby here, a little girl. That doesn't work anymore. What's wrong with my... <laughs> there is something wrong with this baby. And he tried and she escaped always. But for us, unfortunately, from the very moment, of, unless you're immaculate, but uh, let, me <laughs> let us know. Uh, <laughs> the very moment of our conception, we, were we had the mark of the devil. So that's the reason why there is an exorcism during the baptism, or a little exorcism. The solemn exorcism, called a major exorcism, can be performed only by a priest and with the permission of the bishop. Discipline. The priest must proceed with prudence, strictly observing the rules established by the church. Exorcism is directed at the expulsion of demons and to the liberation from demonic possession through the spiritual authority which Jesus entrusted to his church. Illness, especially psychological illness, is a very different matter. Treating this is the concern of medical science. Therefore, before an exorcism is performed, it is important to ascertain that one is dealing with the presence of the evil one and not an illness, of course. Is that oh, illness? illness. illness. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I do what I can. Right? <laughs> Sickness. <laughs> Guy was sick. <laughs> Let's finish with one thing. The difference between a prayer of deliverance and exorcism. What you can never do, because it would be an exorcism or a form of exorcism, is to pray over someone, commanding, giving orders to the devil. I ask you in the name of the Lord, give me your name. You know, you don't do that. Who are you to say that? Maybe you baptize and as a baptized, you have the power to do it and maybe will, it will be uh, constrained by your baptism power, baptismal power to do it. But because you do it without the protection of the church, he will remember your name, I can tell you. Because when you have someone who is proud, if he had to obey against his will, he will have his revenge. So it's very dangerous to do that. So you don't give orders to the devil, but what you can always do, and you don't need to be a priest, you don't need to pray for someone, even with the laying on of hands, and to say, Lord, I know that this person has some problems, would you like to set her free? That is a prayer of deliverance. It's good sometimes if you're not used to and you're scared to do that, you, you come and to see a priest. But it's very different. In technical world, we say that it's not imprecative, but deprecative. You don't command the devil, imprecation. You just ask God to deliver someone. Right? It's just a prayer. And at this moment, we say it's a prayer of deliverance. And it's very powerful. So people, you know, uh, really, uh, they don't need an exorcism. Most of the time, a prayer of deliverance like that can be performed by any priest. And I think they should do more often because it's very powerful. And people can be delivered from infestations like that. Always, again, with a lot of prudence. And the climate is very important. It must be climate of peace. And, you know, each time Jesus did a miracle, so it's always peaceful. When you feel that everybody is trembling, it's kind of, well, 
you can have charismatic things, and I really like uh, charismatic movement. And, but I like when it's done uh, with kind of humor and you don't take it too seriously. You know, the spirit comes and pfft. <laughs> uh, if you start having uh, people trembling, you say, oh, come on, take your pills, uh, <laughs> have a rest. You know, because uh, <laughs> it's not the way. You, in the Bible, in the, the Gospel, Jesus doesn't do that. When he came now, he said, just fill the jars and you have uh, wine for everybody. After in the synagogue, tomorrow we'll have this text to finish with where we started this morning. He doesn't start trembling and f necessarily speaking in tongues and go away, Satan. He say, go away, please. And, you know, <laughs> just his presence is enough. And normally, if you, have, you feel, you feel that there is an harmony, there is peace, and even an exorcism should be performed as much as it's possible in a climate of peace, at least inner peace. You keep the way of the lamb. You will never build the kingdom of the lamb with the way of the lion. If you want to set someone free, you have to be free inside. If you want to give peace to someone, you have to be peaceful inside. If you want someone to become a lamb, you have to use the way of the lamb. So I hope that it will be useful for you, uh, especially to nourish your faith, to nourish your hope, to nourish your charity, and uh, in case of difficulties, to know that there are all these ways that the Church provides for us to help us, and we have already the victory. So thank you for coming, uh, for being so n a lot of people today. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou amongst women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God.